All right, so we are going to continue this unit with the digestive system. Okay, so first we're going to split up um, the abdominal cavity into different regions. So we'll talk about that. Um, we're going to review a bit about the peritoneum, which is that serous cavity, which is our third one. We've covered, you know, the pericardium and the pleura in the heart and the lungs, or I should say around the heart and the lungs. So we're going to finish off with the peritoneum, and it's a little bit special that way. Um, and then we're going to walk our way through the entire process of digestion. Um, and then we're going to review a little bit of the histology. Um, what kind of special features does smooth muscle have? We've talked about cardiac muscle and skeletal muscle, but how is smooth muscle a little bit different? And then we're going to go through all the organs of the digestive system. So we call um, the alimentary canal the main part of the digestive system. Anything that food is going to touch, that's part of the alimentary canal. Um, but we do have some accessory organs, and these are going to be uh, helper organs in digestion. So they may not touch the food, but they're just as important in the process of digestion. And then at the end, we're going to talk a little bit about some disorders and development. So let's start with an overview of the digestive system. So we can divide up the organs of the digestive system into two different groups. And this is kind of what I was hinting at um, on the previous slide, is that we have the alimentary canal. And pretty much it's the whole digestive system is just one long tube, right? From mouth to anus, it's just one long tube. So we've got some different organs that make up that tube, um, but pretty much anything that the food is going to touch and move through that's part of the alimentary canal. So um, we do have some um, exceptions to that with our accessory organs, but we'll talk about that in a minute. So the accessory organs are really ones that are going to aid in digestion. They're just as important as the organs in the alimentary canal. But in general, as a rule, they don't uh, come in contact with the food or the digestive substance, which we call chyme. Um, so the exceptions to that is the teeth and the tongue. So they're, they live in the, in the mouth and the oral cavity, and they do come in contact with the food but they are considered accessory organs. But our other organs are ones that are gonna secrete um, some sort of digestive substance that's going to help chemically break down the food as it gets through, okay? So at the beginning of the course, we divided the abdomen up into just four kind of general um, areas, um, kind of right upper, right lower, left upper, left lower. But now we're going to get into a little bit more detail and we're going to draw four lines that's going to divide the abdomen into nine different regions. So, and don't worry too much about where these lines kind of start and stop, but essentially if we draw a line down from mid clavicle region, that's how we get these two vertical lines, okay? And then we're gonna do two horizontal lines, one kind of right under the thoracic region and kind of one at the wings of the ilium, okay? So that's how we get those other uh, horizontal lines okay so again don't worry too much about how we draw this but again just kind of be able to recognize um, the organs that are going to live in these regions okay so let's look at that okay so if we draw our lines over our abdomen and we know the organs underneath um, we can start kind of up in this right hypochondriac region we see that the liver the majority of the liver and the gallbladder live in this region and then if we look kind of in that middle upper region which is the epigastric region we see the stomach so again gastric um, you see that there so gastric is usually stomach and then we have the left hypochondriac, which we see um, mostly the spleen over there, even though it's not on this picture. So don't worry too much about that. Okay. And then if we go through our middle regions, we have our right lumbar. Okay. A lot of the large intestine, that ascending large intestine. 
Then right in the middle we call the umbilical region is pretty much just small intestine. Maybe a little bit of that transverse colon. And then our left lumbar region is the descending colon. Okay. And then our right iliac or right inguinal, either one is fine with me. I usually use iliac. Um, notice this is where our appendix lives. So that is often a location where, you know, a patient comes in with, you know, right lower abdominal pain and you now know, okay, well, that's where the appendix lives. Hmm, that could be a problem, right? So if you know kind of where um, these organs live, you might have an idea of what could be causing some of the problems. And then we have our hypogastric region here, which has a lot of the um, small intestine, uh, large intestine, rectum, and also bladder. Okay. And then last but not least, that left iliac or left inguinal region um, is pretty much just part of that uh, colon, a sigmoid colon. Okay, so just kind of be able to recognize some of these organs in these different regions. So now we're going to review our peritoneum. So remember we were talking about our three serous membranes, you know, our three P's. So this is our last one that we're going to go through in a little bit more detail. So again, we always have two serous membranes, right? A parietal and a visceral. So we've got our visceral peritoneum that's right up against the organs, and we have our parietal peritoneum, which lines that body wall, okay? And then in between those two membranes, we have a cavity, and that's a, the peritoneal cavity, which is essentially um, a potential space, right? So that's going to be full of the serous fluid. So it allows all these organs to move and we'll see a video about how, how much these organs really move during digestion. Now we have a special feature of the peritoneum and it's a double layer of peritoneum. So essentially two of the layers come together. So essentially you have, you know, two visceral peritoneum that's going to come together and create what's called a mesentery. Okay. And the mesentery, essentially the whole job of the mesentery is kind of hold the organs in place. It tethers them to the back of the body wall. But it also is a great um, site for fat storage. So energy storage, it's very common. And it's kind of yellow in color because of the fat storage. And essentially how we get um, the blood circulation to the abdominal organs is through the mesentery, th into those digestive uh, organs. So it provides kind of a stable route instead of just hanging out somewhere in the middle of the abdomen. It's going to hold those vessels in place as well as the nerves. So let's look at these mesenteries. So we have a couple of different types of mesenteries just depending on where it's coming from and what organs it's attaching to. So if we split up the abdomen into um, the ventral portion and the dorsal portion, remember that's the same as anterior and, ven and posterior, we can group these different mesenteries into ventral and dorsal mesenteries. So here's a great picture on the right to show you kind of the difference. So our only two ventral mesenteries is the falsiform ligament, which is right here. And essentially it just attaches the anterior side of the liver to the ventral or anterior body wall. Okay. And then we also have the lesser omentum, which is here that attaches the lesser curvature of the stomach to the liver. And essentially that then attaches kind of all the way to the front of the body wall as well. So again, ventral mesenteries, the attachments are gonna be on the ventral surface of the abdomen or anterior surface of the abdomen, okay? And we talked about the falsiform ligament in lab, so um, we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. It's a remnant structure of um, those fetal umbilical vessels. 
So then the dorsal mesenteries, on the other hand, are all going to attach to the dorsal abdomen or posterior abdomen, okay? So we'll talk about those different ones in the next slide. So if we look at the dorsal mesenteries, these guys are going to all attach to the back of the body wall. Well, first we have the greater omentum. And this one is going to come off of the greater curvature of the stomach. Okay, so it's right here. And it, what it does is it actually folds over on itself again. So it's actually even um, doubled up again. So not only is a mesentery a double peritoneum, this one folds on itself again. And it's going to come up and attach back to the body wall. Okay. And it kind of lays over the front of all the other uh, visceral organs. So it looks kind of like a little apron or a fatty apron. It's kind of funny looking. Um, so we'll see a picture of that. And then we have our mesentery proper. So all of them are kind of generally termed mesenteries, but we have omentum, which are only in the stomach or connected to the stomach. And then we have mesentery proper, which attaches to the small intestine. So it's going to come and attach out to all these loops of small intestine. Okay. And that's, again, a big part of where all the mesenteric arteries and ve vessels are running, right? We talked about the superior and inferior mesenteric uh, vessels. So they're going to run through that mesentery proper, which is why they're named that way. If you are wondering, everything kind of starts coming together. And then all the nerves also run through these mesenteries as well. And then the mesocolon, so think colon, right, is going to hold the large intestine or the colon to the back of the body wall. And uh, we can only see a part of it right here, okay? So it's kind of kind of attached with the omentum as well back to the dorsal wall. Uh, but we'll see a little bit more about the mesocolon. And essentially it attaches all parts of the colon. So we have the ascending, transverse, descending, and sigmoid colon. So that's all going to have a mesocolon that attaches to it um, to, and then attaches to the body wall. Okay. So here's some good pictures. So on the upper left, we've got um, a picture of the cadaver. And you can see that kind of lacy, kind of fatty apron appearance of the greater omentum. So it kind of just lays over all the other organs. And then the lower left, you can see the greater omentum kind of um, reflected backwards. So you can see some of the organs underneath. Okay, but let's go now up to the upper right picture and we've um, taken off that greater omentum and we've kind of lifted up the liver so we can see that lesser omentum that's attaching to that uh, lesser curvature of the stomach. And then that's going to tie into that liver and attach to the ventral abdomen. Okay. Now, if we go to our lower pictures and we've reflected that uh, greater omentum, and we've also cut off some of the small intestine. So on the right side, you can see the mesentery that's cut away. So essentially, it's going to attach to all those loops of small intestine. Okay, so we've cut away a lot of that small intestine, but you can appreciate the folds of the mesentery. Okay. You can also see the little red and blue dots in there. That's going to signify the blood vessels that are coming in, those mesenteric vessels. Okay. And then on the left, we have our mesocolon. Okay. So here's the transverse mesocolon, okay. the sigmoid colon. Um, and then you can also see a good picture of the mesentery proper itself with the small intestine still attached. So, you know, in the movies where, you know, somebody gets a big old gut laceration and all the guts spill out onto the floor, well, that actually would never happen 
um, because of these mesenteries, because it actually attaches the, the intestines really, really strongly to the back of the body wall. So unless you have a really, really deep cut all the way back to the root of the mesentery in that dorsal abdomen, you this would never happen. So your intestines really would never fall out onto the ground, just as an FYI. So now let's talk about organs that are living inside the abdominal cavity. So we've talked about the ones that are in the peritoneal cavity, right? So we've just talked about all the different peritoneums and the mesenteries. So these guys, these organs are in the peritoneal cavity. They're surrounded by peritoneum, right? So those are called intraperitoneal organs, okay? So they, they have their mesenteries attached to them. Now we do have some organs, both, um, most of them are in the digestive system, but some are not, um, like the kidneys are in the urinary system. So these guys are called retroperitoneal because they're actually sitting outside the peritoneum, okay? So they're sitting behind the peritoneum and they no longer have a mesentery or a peritoneum attached to them. Okay, so great example is the kidneys. So if we look at our picture on the right here, because what happens is um, they, some of them actually start in the peritoneal cavity and then they move into the retroperitoneal cavity. Okay, so that's called secondarily retroperitoneal. So essentially they start in that abdomen in the peritoneal cavity and then they migrate uh, to the retroperitoneal space and then they lose their mesentery. Okay, so this picture, and this is all during, you know, fetal development, okay, with the secondary uh, retroperitoneal. So the first picture on the left is um, here's the tube of the digestive tract, probably the duodenum, okay, that first part of the small intestine. Essentially, it started in that peritoneal cavity, but then it's going to move and join the kidneys in this retroperitoneal space. So now in the picture on the right, you see that that portion of small intestine or the duodenum is actually stuck outside the peritoneal cavity with the kidneys. So the kidneys were always, they always started in that retroperitoneal space, but the, um, the pancreas, the duodenum and rectum all kind of started in the peritoneal cavity and migrate um, outwards, okay? So just as, so we see this whole picture all together. So you can see all the mesenteries and also where the organs are gonna sit. So anything that has a cavity, right? So this is all the peritoneal cavity. So you can follow that, it's all full of fluid, right? But then you see that there's a space behind here in the yellow and you see the pancreas and you see the duodenum, okay? And then you also see the rectum down here. And that's all in the retroperitoneal space. So that's where um, these guys live. So a couple of the digestive organs sit in that retroperitoneal space and lose their mesenteries. Now we're gonna go through the process of digestion. So how do we actually break down the food into manageable sizes into the basic nutrients that we're able to absorb into our bloodstream and the lymphatic system? So just depending on whether you're protein, sugar, or fat, it depends on where you're going to be absorbed. So what are these six stages of digestion? So first we have to get the food into the digestive system. So that is ingestion, right, into the mouth. And then we have to move it through the digestive system and that's called propulsion. And then peristalsis is really the, a very specific term for um, squeezing food through the alimentary canal. Okay, so that's the major means of propulsion in the digestive system. So first we have to mechanically break down the food. So we have to pound it into smaller pieces, right? To be able to then chemically break it down. So this occurs in the mouth, you know, we chew our food, right? So our teeth and our tongue are gonna help break down the food in our mouth. 
And then that also happens in the stomach and small intestine. So the stomach churns it around and in the small intestine, it actually squeezes it back and forth and that's called segmentation. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So once we mechanically break down the food, we're able to chemically break down the food. And so chemical digestion, we use uh, different secretions uh, from our body to be able to chemically break down the food into out the basic nutrients, right, that we can absorb. So these are the locations of all this chemical digestion. So it even starts in the mouth. So we have those salivary glands that are going to be producing saliva and saliva has an enzyme in there called amylase. You don't need to know that, but essentially it starts breaking down carbohydrates in the mouth. And then in the stomach, we have acids, right? So hydrochloric acid um, is going to break down proteins. So that's where we do our protein digestion. And then in the small intestine, that's really where the majority of chemical digestion happens. The small intestine is kind of the big player for chemical digestion because that's where the bile from the liver and gallbladder come in. And it's where all the pancreatic enzymes come in as well. And so all of these um, bile specifically breaks down fat and then the pancreatic enzymes kind of break down everything. So it's kind of where we finish all of our chemical digestion is in the duodenum in that first part of the small intestine. So then once we have all those nutrients, we can absorb them. So we're going to um, absorb all those nutrients in the small intestine into the bloodstream. Okay, so then we're going to transport all those good nutrients to the liver, right, via that hepatic portal system. And any food that we can't um, break down into nutrients, so these are our indigestible substances such as cellulose. So some animals are really good at breaking down cellulose because they um, can ferment it with microbes and bacteria in their intestines, such as herbivores. Um, they're very good at breaking down cellulose, but we are not so good. We have some bacteria in our large intestine, but it's not as good as uh, herbivores. So mostly it's fiber, right? Cellulose, that's gonna be our indigestible substances. And so we eliminate anything we can't utilize as feces. So now what's the difference between peristalsis and segmentation? So they are both um, different forms of squeezing in the alimentary canal in that tube. So peristalsis, is moving in one direction. So it's squeezing it from one direction to another. Okay, so it's pretty much going in the movement of mouth to anus. Okay, so that's this first picture is peristalsis. So essentially everything is just moving in that one direction. Whereas segmentation is a mixing. So essentially it squeezes it back and forth so that you get a mixture of food. Okay, so this is part of that mechanical digestion where it mixes it around, okay? So it mixes it so that the juices can get in there and break down everything. So now let's talk about the histology of the alimentary canal. So remember, it's just one long tube, right? So we just change organs depending on where we are in the system. Um, but it's really the same four layers throughout the entire canal. So from esophagus to the anus, it's essentially the same four layers, which makes this really easy. So the mucosa is the innermost layer and that contains your epithelium. So really think your epithelial tissue, just that underlying lamina propria, which is that basement membrane. And then it does have its own little layer of muscle, but don't worry too much about that. That's not the smooth muscle we're gonna talk about, okay? It's not doing the propulsion and the peristalsis and all of that. And then under that we have the submucosa 
And that's really where your blood supply is, your lymphatic uh, system and your nerve um, fibers. So that's really where all those are as well as the glands. So the glands are also in the submucosa. So again, if we look at our picture over here, so we have our mucosa in the middle, that's the epithelial tissue, and it goes all the way out to this layer, small layer of smooth muscle. And then the rest of this layer here is gonna be your submucosa. Okay, so see all the blood vessels coming in and then all the nerve tissue, but also those glands as well. Okay, and then superficial to that is your muscular layer. So muscularis externa, okay? And there's two layers of muscle. It's actually one going kind of in a circular pattern and one going in a longitudinal pattern. Okay, so you, if you see here, there's one layer going like this in a circular pattern, and then the outer layer is going longitudinally up and down. Okay, so that allows for the movements that it can do. So rem remember, it can do the peristalsis, which squeezes it in one direction. Okay, whereas the um, segmentation is going to squeeze it back and forth. So that's the circular movement and it just squeezes the tube back and forth. Okay, so those are our two different um, smooth muscle layers. And then the outermost layer is your connective tissue layer, right? So it's really the same as the visceral peritoneum if you're in the peritoneal cavity, right? So if you're in this um, in the thoracic cavity like the esophagus, it's going to be adventitia instead of serosa, okay? So same four layers except that outermost layer the, is either going to be the serosa which is the same as the visceral peritoneum if you're in the abdomen, in the peritoneal cavity, or it's going to be adventitia if you're in the thorax. So let's talk a little bit more about the smooth muscle. So these are the two layers, the um, circular layer and longitudinal layer. So we talked a little bit about smooth muscle when we were talking about the general um, smooth muscle, but um, it has kind of a spindeloid shape or kind of an elongated shape um, and it has a very centrally located nucleus so it looks very different than the other two muscle types it doesn't have the striation right so it's smooth and so our two layers right the longitudinal circular and we already went through this that longitudinal so i just wrote it out for you the longitudinal layer shortens right along the long axis and the circular layer squeezes okay so how does smooth muscle contract so you you may think okay well it doesn't have striations and the thing that creates the striations what did we say was that contractile unit of muscle does anyone remember sarcomeres so remember we only make up these sarcomeres in the, the skeletal muscle and the cardiac muscle so we have no sarcomeres here okay so how does smooth muscle contract well it does have myofilaments okay so they're different than our actin and myosin filaments but they do have myofilaments and they're connected to these little dense bodies Okay, so if we look at our little picture over here, these little circular dots are called dense bodies. They're kind of like little anchors. And the myofilaments are going to connect to those little dense bodies. Okay. And they're similar to a Z-disc, right, when we're talking about skeletal or cardiac muscle. And essentially what happens is, is along between the two dense bodies, along the myofilament, it's going to shorten. Okay, so it's going to shorten like this and like that. So the dense bodies are going to kind of get closer together. Okay, and what happens is it kind of looks like a Chinese finger trap. Okay, so it looks like this and the whole thing shortens together. Okay. 
So all those little myofilaments are going to, um, they does do a sliding kind of shortening, just like skeletal muscle, but it's a little bit different, okay? Um, so don't worry too much about how the mechanism of it, but just know that it's a little bit different um, and we have these dense bodies. And the thing too about smooth muscle, think about the job it's doing, right? So it's squeezing ingesta kind of all day long, right? Or at least after a meal for a few hours. Um, and it, so it takes a lot longer to contract and relax, but it's very resistant to fatigue. So, you know, you don't need to jet propulse the stuff through your intestines, right? It actually has to go through fairly slowly so that you can absorb the nutrients. So you don't need to contract fast like your skeletal muscle and your um, cardiac muscle. So very low energy requirements, very few mitochondria. So it's very resistant to fatigue because it, con it contracts and it relaxes so slowly, okay? So I have a great peristalsis video of intestines that you can actually see moving in real time. And it's kind of really interesting but kind of gross at the same time so i'll post this video on canvas as well for you so now what's cool about the intestines is it has its own um, nervous system so the gi tract really has its own nervous system and you might think well that's kind of weird and it's under the control of the autonomic nervous system, right? Because we talked about, you know, rest and digest definitely stimulates our digestion. But within the GI tract itself, it has its own nerve plexuses. So it has two nerve plexuses. One is the myenteric nerve plexus. So think myo, so for muscle. So this is going to kind of be between our two layers of smooth muscle. They call it the brain in the gut because it kind of does its own thing. Um, but this is gonna control that movement, this peristalsis and the segmentation, okay? And then we have a submucosal nerve plexus. So under the, in the submucosa, so under the mucosa, so between the mucosa and the smooth muscle layer, sits this nerve plexus, okay? And essentially what it does is it's going to uh, signal those glands in the submucosa to secrete mucus, right? So help with digestion and all of that good stuff. So like I said, it is under the control of the autonomic nervous system and essentially it can either stimulate it or depress it. So it does its own thing, kind of like that's why we call it the brain and the gut. But the parasympathetic is going to stimulate it to increase digestion, okay? Whereas the sympathetic is going to depress the enteric nervous system so that you decrease digestion, right? You don't need to be digesting if you're fight or flight, okay? You also have all those visceral sensory fibers as well. It's why you're able to, you know, sense GI uh, upset, right? Pain, stretch, all that stuff in your intestines as well. So now we're going to go through all the actual organs of the digestive system. So that's all the organs of the alimentary canal and the accessory organs. So this just shows you um, a good comprehensive picture of all those. Okay, so if you imagine, you know, say if it's lunchtime, you ate a piece of pizza, right, it's going to enter your mouth. You've got your tongue, your salivary glands, your teeth all that stuff to start digestion in the mouth and you're going to go through the esophagus into the stomach right and that's where all that uh, mechanical breakdown chemical breakdown is going to happen and you're going to enter the small intestine okay and that's where all those pancreatic juices are going to come in the bile from the liver and gallbladder and so that's where all that chemical breakdown is going to happen then you're gonna wake, work your way through all the small intestines so that all those nutrients can get absorbed. And then you're gonna enter the large intestine, okay? And that's where you're gonna reclaim all that water and everything, and then anything that's not digested, it's gonna go out the rectum and anus, okay? 
So let's work our way through all of this. So now let's start in the mouth, okay? Does anyone remember what epithelial tissue we have in the oral cavity? Hopefully we remember. That's right, that's the stratified squamous epithelium is our mucosal layer. And essentially we've got some accessory organs in the mouth as well. So we have the tongue and the teeth. Um, and the, t the tongue is tethered and the lips are tethered by something called uh, a frenulum. Okay, so we have a labial frenulum for the lips and a lingual frenulum for the tongue. So it just ties the tongue down and keeps the lips um, tied to the gums. And then the palate, right? We have a hard palate and a soft palate. And why the hard palate is important is because your tongue is able to press food up against the roof of, roof of the mouth, against that hard palate. So it just aids in uh, digestion, right? So the tongue has a couple of different features in it. We've talked about having uh, taste buds on the tongue and we have some tonsils, right? The lingual tonsils. Um, so it is a whole muscle in itself as well. So we talked about intrinsic and extrinsic muscles to help move the tongue around and aid in digestion. So we've already talked about these different types of taste buds, right? So the ones that have taste buds are these guys, the fungiform and valate papillae. But all along the rest of the tongue, you do have these little filiform papillae. And essentially it helps to um, roughen the tongue and helps to move food around in the mouth. Um, but it also senses texture. It's how you can you know, sense that you're eating something slimy. Um, which I know is really gross, but you know, you can sense that, right? Something slimy is very different than something, you know, dry. So that has to do with your tongue papillae. Don't worry about the terminal sulcus. Really, it just marks between um, your valate papillae and that lingual tonsil. So the teeth, I don't really need you to know the different numbers of teeth. Okay, just know that you have deciduous teeth, right, which are your baby teeth, um, and then you have permanent or adult teeth. But I do want you to know the teeth structure or a tooth structure. So the crown is anything above the gum line, right? So the crown is what you can see. It's the exposed surface. And then the root is what is in that socket, right, that um, the part of the either maxilla or mandible, the, the skull, right? And then the in the inside the root, you have uh, the root canal, which houses the pulp cavity. And the pulp cavity is what contains the nerves and the vessels, right, for the, for the tooth. And really the tooth is made out of enamel and dentin, which is some of the strongest um, items in your body, it's even stronger than bone. So that's why your teeth are so strong to be able to break down all that food. Um, and you, it shows up really, really bright on x-ray, which is kind of fun. And then you do have this stuff called cement, okay? So cement is what is going to actually anchor um, the tooth to the periodontal ligament, which is part of the bone, in the bone. Okay, so that's kind of cool. So there's that periodontal ligament, which is going to attach to the bone, and then it attaches via that cement, which attaches to that uh, root. So again, you don't need to know all the numbers of your teeth and things like that, but this just kind of shows you a little bit about that. Your baby teeth are deciduous teeth and then your permanent teeth. So the salivary glands, these guys are going to produce your saliva, and that's really going to start that breakdown of carbohydrates, so sugars. So the biggest one is your parotid gland, so it sits kind of right in front of your ear. Okay, so that's the parotid gland, and it has a large duct, the duct that comes along the maxilla. Okay. And then it's gonna open up right above those molars up on the upper arcade 
of your teeth. And then you have your submandibular gland, which sits kind of medial, kind of on the inside of your mandible. Um, and then you have that sublingual um, gland as well. And I know this is kind of really funny, but if anybody you see the duct opening kind of right near that lingual frenulum, you can actually see that when you open your mouth and lift your tongue up, you can actually see that duct opening. And this is how some people can actually shoot saliva out of their mouth. I know this is gross, but my brother used to do it. It's called gleeking, right? Back in the day, that was like a thing. Anyways, I digress. <laughs> um, these are your salivary glands, all to aid in the digestion of carbohydrates. So once you finish chewing your food and you start that breakdown with saliva, you're going to enter the pharynx. So first you're going to go through the back, the oropharynx, and then you're going to go through the laryngopharynx. And so this continues to be that stratified squamous epithelium. And then you have some external muscle layers. So this, so you're still in the skeletal muscle up here, right? So you're able to uh, swallow voluntarily, right? So these are those pharyngeal constrictor muscles. So it's going to pass that food into the esophagus. So the esophagus is really fairly simple. It's just one long muscular tube. But this is also where we change um, from skeletal muscle to smooth muscle. So it continues from that pharynx, and then it's going to join the stomach at the bottom. And where it joins the stomach, it's called the cardiac sphincter or lower esophageal sphincter. I like cardiac sphincter um, just because that's the cardia of the stomach, that region. But if you have problems with the sphincter, so it should close, right, to prevent um, the stomach contents from coming back up the esophagus. And essentially a lot of people um, get heartburn or have GERDs. Uh, and this is what happens is that that stomach contents come back, comes back up the esophagus and it burns, right? So your stomach is able to handle the acid, but your esophagus is not. So that's how you get that heartburn um, effect. So if we look at the muscular layers of the esophagus, they're very similar to um, the rest of the tube, but this is where we switch, right? So the first part or the first one third of the esophagus is skeletal muscle. And then we kind of mix, okay? So kind of the middle, we have a mixture of, of skeletal and smooth. And then we finally get to smooth muscle at the, at the inferior one third. And again, the outermost layer is that adventitia that we talked about earlier. So same, it's just connective tissue, but it's not the peritoneum, right? So we're not in the abdominal cavity. We're not in the, in the peritoneal cavity. So we're called adventitia instead of serosa. So we continue to be stratified squamous epithelium, right? All the way through the esophagus. And essentially, it, uh, the esophagus allows for expansion. So it um, can contract when it's empty, but then it does expand when you have a food bolus that goes through. And just like we talked about with the submucosa, you're going to have those mucus glands in that submucosa to help with the um, movement of food. Uh, through the esophagus because that's where right at the end is where you're going to really start that peristaltic movement. So now we've made our way into the stomach from the esophagus. So now our pizza is really not going to look much like pizza anymore. So this is the site of mechanical and chemical digestion. So this food is going to be churned and beaten up and it's going to look like not food anymore and we call it chyme. So it's a mixture of all this um, secretions and water and mucus and essentially it just becomes this uh, chyme, this food bolus. So 
what happens also in the stomach is we have this pepsin and pepsin is an enzyme that breaks down protein but it really only functions under acidic conditions so that's why the stomach secretes that hydrochloric acid to activate pepsin and the stomach is really good at accommodating um, acidic environments whereas uh, the esophagus and the small intestine doesn't. So we'll talk about how we get rid of that acidic um, condition when our food bolus or our chyme moves from the stomach into that small intestine. And we've already talked about how it affects the esophagus with heartburn. So essentially the same thing can happen. We can get ulcers um, in the small intestine as well as in the stomach too. So if we have too much acid, that can be a problem, right? So we do get some stomach ulcers as well. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So the big thing is the stomach is just one big layers of muscle. So three layers of muscle. We've talked about the two in the rest of the canal, um, our circular layer and longitudinal layer, but now we've added a third and that's the oblique layer. So it really aids in that churning <clears throat> and moving that food around to help mechanically break it down. The other big thing about the stomach is its ability to stretch. So it has these folds, which are called rugae, and these guys allow that stretch. So if we take a look here, you can see the inside of the stomach looks like a bunch of little worms, and that is the rugae. So it allows it to stretch. And you know, you eat a huge meal and you feel like you have a food baby. Well, that is the stomach. It's really able to stretch quite a lot. So we do have some different regions of the stomach. So the first opening to the stomach where the esophagus comes in is the cardia. And then it has this little bulbous area called the fundus. So it kind of is the protruding area. And then we have the body, which is pretty much the majority of the stomach. But then once you get to the bottom here and it kind of makes a turn, then we become the pylorus. Okay, and don't worry about the pyloric antrum, pyloric canal, that kind of stuff. Just that whole area is the pylorus. And then we have to go out the pyloric sphincter to get into the duodenum, which is the first part of the small intestine. So the small intestine is the largest portion of the digestive system or the alimentary canal, even though it's called the small intestine, counterintuitive, but it has to do with the diameter of the tube and not the length. So this is really where a lot of our chemical digestion happens. So what happens in the beginning of the small intestine is where we finish um, all that enzymatic and chemical breakdown of the food. So then we have our nutrients, right? Now we're able to absorb the nutrients. So the rest of the small intestine, that all those nutrients are being absorbed into the bloodstream and into the lymphatic system. So the first portion of it is the duodenum or duodenum if you want to be British and remember how to spell it. And then the second portion is the jejunum, which is probably the longest portion. And then you have the ileum. And essentially you can't really tell where the jejunum ends and where the ileum begins. Um, you can histologically, but not grossly, okay? And the uh, duodenum is the shortest uh, portion and some of it um, does go retroperitoneal, um, retroperitoneally, just like we talked about um, the pancreas also and the rectum. So it does make a curve back there and is not part of the abdominal cavity. So let's start with that duodenum. It is the shortest but most important section, arguably the most important section, because that's really where all the action is happening. So essentially it is the location where the bile and the pancreatic juices come down and uh, enter into the duodenum. And what happens is, is the bile is coming, being produced in the liver, stored in the gallbladder, we'll talk about that, and then it comes down through the bile duct. 
and it's going to come through this hepatopancreatic ampulla. And it's going to join the pancreatic duct, which has a bunch of enzymes. So all those pancreatic enzymes and the bile are all going to come into the duodenum, okay? So we'll talk a little bit more about the pancreas and the liver as accessory organs, but essentially this is the location, this hepatopancreatic ampulla is going to be where all that, uh, the, oh, those juices come out. And what's important about those juices, not only um, about uh, breaking down fat for the bile and pretty much breaking down everything else for the pancreatic enzymes, is that the pancreatic uh, enzymes and the juices are um, basic. So essentially, they're going to stabilize the pH of all the chyme coming out of the stomach. So remember we said that stomach is super acidic, but the duodenum doesn't like that acidic environment. So essentially, we have some basic, um, some high pH juice coming out of the pancreas, which is going to stabilize that pH so that it's no longer acidic and harmful to the GI system. So now if we take um, a look at the microscopic anatomy of the small intestine, there's some features of it which are really just to increase the surface area. So you're going to increase the surface area so that you can absorb all those nutrients. So I do want you to know these features of the small intestine to increase absorption. So the first one are the circular folds. So if you look at the center, you see all these folds that are kind of going around. They're kind of these circular uh, structures going around the tube of the small intestine. So those are the circular folds. They're just transverse ridges really of the mucosa. And then, so here is one of those folds, and then on top of the fold is a villus. So all these folds have little villi on top of them. And the villi are these little finger-like projections coming off that mucosa. And they are covered with simple columnar epithelium. Okay, so we'll blow that up and take a look. And then even on each of those epithelial cells, those are all covered with microvilli. So you get this serious increase of surface area so that you can absorb all the nutrients that are coming through the digestive system. So let's take a look at that. So here's a picture. We blow up just a little portion of, so we have all these folds, right? So the big folds, and then on each of the folds, we've got these little villi. So let's look at the villi. So here's one villus just right here, right next to another villus. So then if you blow up and look at just one of these epithelial cells, so these are all layered with that simple columnar epithelial cells, and then we blow that up, here's one columnar cell, and we have all those little microvilli on top, the little like comb-like structure, the brush border. So essentially all this is going to increase that surface area for absorption. So we've made our way through all the small intestines. So we've resorbed um, all that nutrients that we really want to keep, all the important fats and sugars and proteins all into the um, hepatic portal system, really, except the fat. That's going to go through the lymphatic system, and we'll talk about that. But really, after we get through that ileum, we're going to dump into the cecum, which is the first port part of the large intestine. So we're going to work our way through the large intestine. And what happens during the large intestine is that we do get some breakdown by bacteria. So essentially, we have some microflora in there that help us break down some uh, fiber and cellulose, not as well as our herbivore friends, like our horse has a huge cecum where they do some fermentation, right? So they break down, all those microbes are going to help them break down all that cellulose that they eat. But for us, the main purpose of our large intestine is really to absorb water. So we don't want to get rid of all that water, we want to keep it. So we're going to resorb all the water and electrolytes, and the main cells that are going to be doing that are the colonocytes. So those guys are the ones that are going to um, absorb all that water 
and electrolytes. And essentially there's a big um, mass peristaltic wave that pushes all the fecal contents toward the rectum. Okay, so again, we're going to get more and more dehydrated as we push towards the rectum. So there are some special features of the large intestine, and there are certain regions of the large intestine. So we said that first portion here is the cecum, and we do have that appendix that's uh, sticking off the cecum. Some people don't have their appendix anymore, like me but it does sit there, right? And that's part of the lymphatic system. So it helps to repopulate that good gut bacteria. Um, say you have some diarrhea or some sort of GI upset and you rid yourself of the gut flora or maybe antibiotics or whatever. Um, the good bacteria, you have a little store there in the appendix and it does help to um, repopulate that gut bacteria. But anyways, once you've come out of that small intestine and you're in the cecum, you're gonna work your way upwards, okay? And that's the ascending colon. And then you're gonna make a turn, you're gonna make a through that hepatic flexure because that's where the liver sits right up here. And then you're gonna go through the transverse colon. And then you're gonna go through the left um, splenic flexure because you're over by the spleen that sits over here. And then you go down, so then you're going through the descending colon into the sigmoid colon. And the sigmoid colon looks kind of like an S, it's kind of S-shaped, and that's how I remember that, into the rectum and into the anal canal. So there are some special features. If you notice, it looks a little different than the small intestine. The small intestine is nice and smooth, whereas the large intestine has a lot of these uh, connective tissue bands and some of these sacculations and these little um, fatty tags. So what are these things? So the, the, the um, band structure is the tenny coli. So it's just a thickening of the muscularis. So essentially just looks like this thick um, band of connective tissue. And then what happens is, is it kind of causes this puckering of the large colon. So you get this, um, these sacculations, right? So it's not smooth like the small intestine. And these little saccules are called haustra. And haustra is plural. One saccule or one saccuation is called a haustrum. Okay, and then these little tag things, these little yellow tags coming off that tenny coli are called epiploic appendages. And essentially they're just fat filled little pouches um, of that visceral peritoneum. So remember that visceral peritoneum is gonna be attached to um, and lines the, um, the wall of the intestines. So essentially they don't really know the purpose of the epiploic appendages, but they are there nonetheless. So, um, yeah, we talked about the cecum already and the appendix. So I've just written out here for you what we talked about in the last slide. So our, our way through the colon and how we divide it up, right? So ascending colon, transverse colon, descending into the sigmoid colon. And then there is a turn there is the hepatic flexure and the splenic flexure. You can call it the right and left colic flexure, but I like hepatic and splenic because it tells you exactly where it is with those organs. And the rectum essentially is really part of the large intestine. It's just has its own section. And then the anal canal is essentially we've got two sphincters in the anal canal and it's lined with that stratified squamous epithelium again. So remember, you know, through the intestine, we had varying different types of, um, you know, mostly simple columnar epithelium for absorption. So now we've switched back to our protective epithelium, our stratified squamous epithelium. Um, and the sphincters, the importance about that is that you have an external and an internal sphincter. So the internal is involuntary, okay? And the external is voluntary, right? So we have a 
decision most of the time of when we want to defecate, right? So we do have voluntary control over that external sphincter. So now that we've gone through kind of the entire tube work of the digestive system, right, the alimentary canal, we're going to talk about um, the accessory organs. So um, the liver has so many other metabolic functions in the body. It's really the largest gland in the body and it has so many functions. We're really just going to touch on its digestive function. Okay, and you'll learn a lot more about it in physiology. So the liver has four lobes, the right one being the largest lobe, and think the liver lives kind of on the right side of the body, so the right lobe is the biggest. And then the left lobe, and this is um, an anterior view of the liver, so we can only see the right and left lobes from this view. So we have to flip it over and look on the inferior side, um, kind of caudal inferior side, uh, to see the caudate and quadrate lobes. Okay. And then we have this ligament here that kind of divides the right and left lobes, and that is the falciform ligament, okay? So in terms of the digestive func functions of the liver, uh, we're really just talking about bile production. So the cells in the liver called hepatocytes are going to produce bile. So bile is what is gonna break down fat. And so we also talked a bit about this when we were talking about the circulatory system, is that the liver also processes all the nutrients that we've absorbed in the digestive tract. So we pick it up in the small intestine and it goes through the mesenteric arteries and veins, right? Uh, well, it picks up into the mesenteric veins, and then it's going to go through that hepatic portal vein to the hepatic portal system, which is in the liver, right? So all those cells can process all the nutrients um, that we just picked up in the small intestine. So now if we look at some pictures of the liver, and we can look at the posterior and inferior side of it essentially because we can only appreciate the right and left lobe from the anterior side so if we flip it over this is going to be the right side so that's that huge right liver lobe and then we have our left liver lobe over here and then the falciform ligament ligament runs right in between those two okay so that's the falciform ligament and then we have two more lobes, right? So these are the smaller lobes. So if you notice, here's our gallbladder, which is nicely colored in green. Then in between the left lobe and that falciform ligament, we see this little lobe right here. And that's the quadrate lobe, okay? And that's on the anterior side. So this is the anterior side, and this is the posterior side, because here's our um, inferior vena cava and that runs along the spine right on the posterior side of the abdomen and so then in between that and the kind of the right lobe and the left lobe we have that caudate lobe so that's going to be caudal so if you know kind of caudal if we remember that from when we were talking about kind of rostral and caudal with our head structures it means towards the tail so if you remember that and you remember the caudate lobe is caudal, okay? So this picture just reminds us about the hepatic portal system. So those mesenteric veins are gonna pick up all the digestive nutrients and it's gonna bring it all through that hepatic portal vein through the liver and then we're gonna process all that good nutrients and then that blood is gonna exit through those hepatic veins to the inferior vena cava. So now if we look at the microscopic anatomy of the liver, it looks like these little hexagons, okay? So if we actually take a little slice of the liver and we blow it up and look at it under the microscope, you can kind of see all these little hexagon patterns with a hole in the middle, right? So one of these little hexagons is called a lobule. So that's one liver lobule, okay? And in the middle of that lobule is a central vein, okay? 
And all these little dots, all through here, these little brown dots are all hepatocytes. So hepatocytes are the functional cells of the liver. So they're gonna be the ones that are producing all that bile. And then they're also gonna be processing all those nutrients. Okay. And then at each corner, so we have our little hexagon lobule, each corner of that lobule, there's gonna be what's called a portal triad, okay? So the portal triad is composed of a bile duct, a portal venule, and a portal arterial. So think that you have blood coming into the liver, so it's gonna be arterial blood, and our portal blood, right, our portal venous blood. So we have two types of blood coming into the liver, and then we have bile leaving the liver, right? So it's being produced by the hepatocytes and it's going to leave. So if we look at this great picture here, so if we blow up just one of those lobules, those hexagon shapes, we have all these little hepatocytes in there. You have your central vein, draining all the blood, okay? So we have at each corner a little portal triad. So portal triad three, right? Triad thinking three. So you've got your portal arterial, bringing in that um, oxygenated blood. You have your portal venule, bringing in that uh, nutrient-rich blood from the intestines. And then you have your bile duct draining the bile out of the liver, okay? And so, all that blood that comes in is gonna be uh, funneled through these sinusoids, okay? So we have these sinusoids, which essentially kind of pool the blood. Remember, they're the leakiest type of capillary, and all that blood is gonna leak out into the hepatocytes, okay? And then the bile is gonna be picked up by these little bile cannuliculi and drain into those little bile ducts, okay? and then finally out the liver and into that common bile duct, which is gonna go to um, the uh, duodenum. So again, remember coming in, we got blood. So blood is gonna come in, arterial and portal, and then it's gonna go through the sinusoids and it's gonna then exit that central canal, central vein, okay? So that central vein is then gonna all drain into a hepatic vein. So these hepatic veins then will drain into the inferior vena cava, okay? And out is gonna be the bile, okay? So the bile's going out, blood coming in. So now if we take a look at the gallbladder, so a lot of people get confused about the gallbladder and think that the gallbladder produces bile, but it does not. The liver produces the bile and the gallbladder just stores it. So it stores and concentrates bile. And then when needed, when you eat a fatty meal, it's gonna expel the bile and it's gonna go through the cystic duct, which connects the gallbladder over to the, um, the bile, common bile duct, okay? So the hepatic ducts are gonna drain the liver and it's gonna join up with the cystic duct out to that um, bile duct, the common bile duct, okay? And that's gonna drain out finally through that hepatopancreatic ampulla into the duodenum to help uh, break down all that fat. So the pancreas we've talked about before when we talked about some of the endocrine uh, organs and glands. And so we talked about the endocrine function producing the insulin and glucagon hormones, but the pancreas, the majority of the pancreas has exocrine function. So it's going to produce um, all these digestive enzymes, so many enzymes, and you don't need to know all the different enzymes, but essentially just know that they're going to be the main part of the chemical digestion, okay? We talked about where it lives in the abdomen, right? So it's back kind of with the uh, duodenum over with the kidneys in that retroperitoneal space. And essentially it produces all these enzymes and then the enzymes are gonna go through the pancreatic duct. And if then it's gonna join that common bile duct and out into the duodenum, okay? And remember it's that 
basic um, digestive juice to help uh, decrease or uh, increase the pH, excuse me, to make it um, more of a balanced pH, neutral pH. So an interesting thing about the pancreas is that it doesn't have its own artery. So the artery, um, it doesn't have its own artery, but it gets its arterial blood from the hepatic, splenic, and superior mesenteric arteries. So it kind of steals blood from some of these other arteries, but it doesn't have its own, which is kind of interesting. So the cells in the pancreas, so I remember we talked about the endocrine cells, those um, alpha and beta cells in those little pancreatic islets, but the majority of the pancreas um, are acinar cells. So the most of them are these big puffy uh, cells that uh, look kind of uh, in grape clusters, okay? So these guys are the ones that are going to be producing all those pancreatic enzymes that are going to drain out through the pancreatic duct. So all these little ducts are going to join into the bigger pancreatic duct. And essentially the enzymes are really activated once they hit the duodenum. And again, we said um, they are alkaline or basic, so we're going to counteract that acidic stomach acid um, once we hit that duodenum, so we protect the rest of the GI tract. So now let's talk through some of the disorders of the digestive system. So we've talked a little bit about peptic ulcers already. So these are um, just erosions of the mucosa in different areas of the um, alimentary canal. But essentially it's very common um, to get them in the stomach, but you can get them in the esophagus and the um, duodenum as well, but most commonly in the stomach. Okay, and really there is a bacteria that can cause ulcers and it's called Helicobacter pylori. And essentially it sits there on the epithelium and causes an overproduction of that um, hydrochloric acid. So it causes inflammation, which then it's uh, the mucosa is more susceptible to all of that um, uh, acid. But um, if that is a common cause of it, but some other causes can be stress, um, as well as the use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, just like um, Advil, Tylenol, aspirin, any of those are all uh, considered NSAIDs. So um, pretty much you have to take um, um, medication to counteract the production of um, acid. So really omeprazole is probably the best um, and really the only treatment uh, for getting rid of ulcers. Um, so I think what's the over-counter of um, omeprazole? Uh, Prilosec. Prilosec. So very common. So we have some other disorders as well. So when we talk about the intestines, we can get obstruction, meaning like a blockage of the intestines. And this is really common in horses. I have a lot of experience with that. Uh, just like I told you guys in class, my horse had a, uh, we call it a, um, impaction. So people can get this as well, and they can have mechanical or non-mechanical obstructions. So mechanical would be something where the intestine actually gets twisted, or a tumor is blocking it, or a foreign object, um, which happens in dogs a lot of the times. Um, adhesions, right? So it gets stuck to something else, some other organ, and it can't move. Non-mechanical would be something that is stopping that normal spare, uh, peristaltic movement. So it's not pushing the, the GI contents through anymore, and so it causes an impaction. And that can be through trauma, surgical manipulation, meaning the surgeon um, touches the intestine. The small intestine is very, very uh, susceptible um, it doesn't like being handled, so it gets um, it causes inflammation and the peristaltic waves can stop, and it's called ileus uh, when that happens. 
Um, another common problem in people too is inflammatory bowel disease. Um, so it just is inflammation of the intestinal wall. Uh, obviously many different causes of that, but there are some diseases. So Crohn's disease um, causes this, uh, and it's uh, what happens is it's actually in the ileum. So it causes these severe ulcers in the ileum. So a little higher up uh, in the digestive system, so it's in the small intestine, uh, versus ulcerative colitis is a little more shallow in the inflammation and it's mostly in the rectum. So a little bit different between those two disorders, but you get the overall you know, IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, just a couple different causes of it. So it just depends on where in the GI tract you're getting that inflammation. So we can also have to, some disorders uh, with the accessory organs as well. So there are a lot of liver problems, but um, viral hepatitis is definitely one of them. So um, it causes kind of flu-like symptoms, uh, jaundice or icterus um, in animals, but jaundice in humans, uh, which causes that kind of yellowing of the mucous membranes, like in your eyes, um, and things like that. Um, and there's a couple different types of viral hepatitis and you can get vaccines against them. Um, but the A, B, C, and G are the, the major types of viral hepatitis. Uh, cystic fibrosis and pancreatitis. So what happens is the pancreatic duct can get blocked with mucus. So remember our cystic fibrosis is that overproduction of mucus, which we talked about it in the respiratory system as well, because you essentially drown in your own mucus, right? Your lungs fill with mucus, but there are other places too. A lot of these, any other exocrine um, glands can be affected by this as well. So essentially, if you block uh, the pancreatic duct, you end up with severe pancreatitis. So pancreatitis is the inflammation of the pancreas. And then you can block the bile duct um, and you can get gallstones, cancer, all kinds of um, terrible things as well. Dogs can get pancreatitis too, just from um, eating a large meal, uh, like a turkey uh, Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, that is a common problem in dogs. They'll come into the hospital for uh, acute pancreatitis. So now we're gonna finish up with a little bit of development of the digestive system, or specifically the elementary canal, which is formed uh, in week three of embryonic development. And essentially there's a yolk sac, okay? So let me get my laser pointer here. So there's a yolk sac that essentially becomes the tube work. So the tube work becomes our alimentary canal. Okay, and the tube is lined with the endoderm. Okay, so remember we talked about our three embryonic um, uh, germ lines, right? So ectoderm being on the outside, mesoderm in the middle, and endoderm on the inside. Okay, so essentially there's this duct, this vitiline duct, which is from the yolk sac, and it creates. Uh, these three structures. So essentially these three regions, uh, the foregut, midgut, and hindgut essentially form all of what we now know as the alimentary canal. So the foregut is going to be our pharynx, essentially to the duodenum. So pharynx, esophagus, stomach into the duodenum. And then the midgut is going to be pretty much most of the small intestine to part of the large intestine. So about to mid transverse colon. And then essentially the hindgut is going to be the rest of the large intestine um, all the way out to the anus. So this just kind of shows you a little bit about um, how the liver and the bile duct and the pancreas all kind of start developing off that um, the alimentary canal, kind of the midgut region. Uh, kind of between the foregut and midgut. But you don't need to know all the details here. It's just kind of a cool picture to show the development.
So the digestive system holds up fairly well over time, but we do get some age-related uh, problems later in life. So about middle age, um, especially women can get gallstones. Uh, so gallstones are, uh, since you get some concentration in the gallbladder, you can form stones. And so they can block the, the bile ducts and cause a lot of pain. So a lot of times uh, gallbladders are removed um, in the middle age area. I've already had mine out. I don't consider myself middle aged, but anyways, um, ulcers are also another thing that can happen. Uh, diverticulosis, which is the picture here, are just little out pockets um, in the linings of the intestines and essentially it traps things like seeds um, of fruit, like strawberry seeds, like really small seeds um, can trap things and it could cause inflammation um, and everything else. So diverticulosis is very common. And then um, pretty much the activity of your digestive organs declines as we age. So you have fewer digestive enzymes and pancreatic juices, and also the peristalsis um, slows down as well. You also get uh, less absorption. So essentially, um, older people don't get as many nutrients from their food as they used to. So that's why a lot of um, older people, you know, need um, help in the nutrient department. Um, and they also have quite a bit of dehydration and constipation. So essentially, they, um, since everything slows down, they absorb more water, which leads to um, drier feces and constipation. And again, we always see cancer, um, especially in the colon. You can see uh, colon cancer, liver cancer, pancreatic cancer, so some accessory organs in there, as well as our main um, alimentary canal, stomach cancer, esophageal cancer. So everywhere pretty much along the digestive system. So here are our learning objectives for today, okay? So next lecture will be on the urinary system. So second to last lecture, we're almost there. And I just love this cartoon because I have had both my appendix and gallbladder removed. So I totally get it. The poor non-essential organ support group. So anyways, hopefully that'll make you smile and hopefully you all are staying safe and well. Bye guys.